All right, well, let's go ahead and get back into our, uh, our series on the book of Genesis. We're going to continue that today. We have just two more weeks until we begin a new series for Christmas called The Sun. And actually, that series is going to get started during the Christmas season, and then it will continue on uh, through the spring. So we're really excited to jump into the life of Christ starting here in just a couple of weeks. But in the meantime, we're going to continue talking about Abraham today. And, um, and I'm just uh, so glad that we can continue to share in this series, even though we're apart. Again, I'm Danny Barry. I'm the lead past, pastor here at Cambridge City Christian Church. And it's a blessing. It's an honor for you to share this time with me today. And, um, and as we do every week, I just want to remind us what we're here for. As a church, we are here. Let's say this together if you're watching online. We are here to love God and to love others more and more. That's what we are as a church. That's what we do. And during this season, as we've already talked about with Thanksgiving in a Bag and Operation Christmas Child, those are two amazing opportunities to be able to reach out with the love of Jesus and to show that we love God and we love others more and more. Well, I want to start off today by asking this question. We'll put it up here on the screen. Who, who of you likes to see a story where the seemingly impossible becomes possible. Those are some of my favorite movies, some of my favorite books, some favorite stories that I've read through the years are those times when, when people just go against all the odds, right? And they do the impossible, things that just seem like they're just too big and just can't be done. Maybe it's a life circumstance or a health issue. They, they go through it. Those things just grab me, my emotions, and it, and it encourages me and spurs me on. And I, and I see many of those stories in the Old Testament. Um, like the story of Joseph and the Israelites and their plight in Egypt. And we see many other stories of how God uses people that just seems impossible. But some of my favorite stories are, are ones like this. You may not be aware of this man and his story, but this is Walt Davis. Walt Davis was in the 1952 Olympic Games where he became the high jump champion. But what really stands out about Walt Davis is that when he was younger, when he was only nine years old, he was paralyzed by polio. Now think about that. He was fully paralyzed by polio, but he didn't give up, and he continued to battle, and he became a, this Olympic high jump champion in 1952. Another favorite story of mine, uh, one of my favorite baseball players of all time, is Lou Gehrig. Did you know that Lou Gehrig, who went, entered into baseball's Hall of Fame, when he was younger, was considered so clumsy as a baseball player that the boys in the neighborhood that he grew up in wouldn't even let him play on their team. But Lou Gehrig was so committed that he didn't give up. He kept trying, he kept practicing, and he got better and better and became one of the greatest players of all time. And then, of course, there's Woodrow Wilson, who was the 28th president of the United States. Did you know that Woodrow Wilson was not even able to read until he was 10 years old? But he was committed at, at growing and understanding and reading, and he became a very uh, well-known man, obviously, as president, but also a very educated and smart man. But these stories, they just jump out at me. They grab me because they remind me that, that impossible things really can't happen. But when it comes to achieving the impossible, I want to ask you this. When it comes to achieving the impossible, what is your default? What is your default when it comes to achieving the impossible? Sure, we're inspired by these stories like the ones that I just shared, but what happens when the impossible things come your way? Now, we would all like to think that we would be like these stories, that we would fight and that we would, would overcome. But let me tell you, all too often in our lives, what do we do? We just put up our hands and we walk away. Or maybe we just resign ourselves to the fact that whatever that thing is in our life, or whatever that person is in our life, whatever it might be, that that is just an impossible situation that is too much to overcome. See, that's where we find ourselves today. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. And we find Sarah. Sarah is the wife of Abram, of Abraham, who we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And we know in the last couple of weeks that God had made this amazing promise to Abraham. And, and remember, he had taken Abraham outside and shown him the stars and said that his, the nation, the people that the nation, the nation that would come from him would be like the stars in the sky. And, and Abraham was on board with God's plan. Even though maybe there were times where he was like, ooh, he was on board with God's plan. But when we come here into Genesis chapter 18, we see 
that his wife, well, Sarah, well, she, she wasn't so much on board with the plan. So if you, if you want to turn in your Bible app, if you want to open your Bible, or you can just follow along with me here on the screens, uh, we're going to go ahead and read just through the first 15 verses. So it says here that the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. Now, now when we look at these two verses, it seems really obvious that Abraham knew who these people were. He knew that it wasn't just anyone. He knew that it was God himself. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of uh, discussion that, happened, that, that is happening about what this verse means in terms of God. Now, was this what's called a theophany, or was this a Christophany? Now, you may ask, well, what's the difference? Well, a theophany is when God appears himself. And there are some instances in the Old Testament of that. But did you know that there are also other things, there are also other appearances that are called Christophanies, which is when Jesus appeared in different places in the Old Testament. This is one of them that most people believe is a Christophany. There's even another one uh, that, that happens with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right, when they were in the, fire, when they were in the fiery furnace, that there was a fourth person that appeared, and almost everyone agrees that that was Jesus. So again, we see here that Jesus, and it looks like a couple of angels, they show up at Abraham's tent, and Abraham knows how important they are, and so he goes about his business. When we look in verse 3, because in verse 3 it says, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may wash all your feet and rest under this tree. Abraham is a really good, hospitable man. And then he says here, let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed, and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. And they answered, very well, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Now, I know most of you probably don't know what a seah is, but it was a lot of flour. It was way more food they were making than what would be needed. But, but Abraham wanted to make sure to bless these special guests. And then what does he do, too? He runs to the herd and selects a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. So again, he wants to treat these guests well. Okay, Then in verse 8, Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and sat these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. So again, Abram, Abraham is being a hospitable man. Now, here's where we come into the, into the gist of where we're going to kind of camp out and focus on today. In verse 9, they ask this, Where is your wife Sarah? Now, you may think that's not too unusual. Here's Abraham. They don't see Sarah... But it was very unusual, it was a very, part of Middle Eastern custom in that time was that you never asked of someone else's wife. So, so again, I think this is important because I think what we're seeing here is God, or Jesus, he's breaking through some of the norms and he wants to know what's going on with Sarah. See, this visit here by Jesus and these angels is not so much about Abraham. This visit isn't about Abraham he knew where Abraham was. He knew where Abraham's faith is. He wanted to know where Sarah stood. Where does Sarah stand in all this? And then in verse 10, Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Jesus, or the angels, knew that Sarah was listening. And it says here, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him, okay, and Abraham and, and Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. There's a little, like, uh, narration there, kind of a note. And then verse 12, and then look how Sarah responds. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn, I mean, you could kind of hear the sarcasm or the anger, whatever you want to call it in her voice. After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? You could just sense her frustration and her skepticism. The skepticism that Sarah had in her heart had made her bitter. And she's even degrading the pleasure of, this, of God's promise by saying that she can't enjoy it because she's old. 
Actually, if you dig even deeper here, there's something that's even more uh, sad here. And that is Sarah is questioning God's honesty and God's ability. She's questioning whether God is truthful and whether he's even able. Now, if you look in chapter 17, some people might point out that there's a place there. We didn't read it. We kind of skipped over to hear these last, uh, from last week until this week. But in chapter 17, there's a place where Abraham as well laughs when God tells him that he's going to have a, ch- when he's going to have a son. But if you look deeper into the passage, it, Abraham was laughing for a different reason. Abraham wasn't laughing because he didn't believe God could do it. He was laughing because he was astonished. He was astonished. He's like, wow, I'm this old and I'm going to have a child. Wow. But when we look at her and her reaction, it was about fear. and It was about doubt. See, where she erred was erred in questioning God's honesty. And that is the danger that we have to be careful of as well. Sure, we can laugh about things that God does in our lives that we aren't expecting. But let me tell you, we should never laugh about God's honesty and God's ability. You know what, as I was thinking more and more about this this week, how, how, does this, how would this be equated in the way that we say things today? I, I think this is how it would work out today. See, what we would say is that the difference here is between saying that when God does something, we might say, wow, that's crazy. God did that, that's crazy. And that's an okay thing to say because God does do some crazy things. But what Sarah's saying here, and maybe we've even said before too, is when we look at God, we might say, God, you are crazy. You see the difference? And that's the problem here. If we look in verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? I mean, you could just tell that, that the Lord is just, he's like, I can't, you're questioning me. Why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. See, this really, this this question here, is the one that confronts us every day. This is the one that confronts us every day with the difficulties that come with life. Will we say, is anything too big for God? Will we question God's ability, or will we agree with it in our hearts? This is what Sarah was confronted with. What did she do? She laughed at God's ability. She questioned his integrity. She became bitter in her heart. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. Don't let yourself get to a place where you question God's ability. Now, yeah, we may wonder about the ways that he does things or how he does things. But never question God's ability. Never question his truthfulness and his honesty with us. And then the final verse, verse 15. And look what Sarah does. Sarah was afraid, and so she lied. And she said, I didn't laugh. (laughs) But the Lord said, oh, yes, you did. See, in this moment, when she was confronted with her lack of faith, she backtracked, and she said something to God. She said something to Jesus that she thought he would want to hear because she did it out of fear. She did it out of fear because she didn't think that God was able. And when I look at this passage, there's a lot here. You can keep reading. There's more things that happen even afterward. But the point today is this. This is the point today for this message, is that the impossible is impossible with God. The the impossible is is impossible with God. So when when we look at this, we realize in this Christophany of Jesus, it's really a surprising one, isn't it? And it shows that God wanted to back up the promise that he had given to Abraham and even to Sarah. He wanted to back it up with his presence. You know, God isn't the type of person who's going to give a promise and then just kind of stand idly back when things maybe aren't working out quite so well, and, or at least the way that it appears doesn't work, isn't working quite so well. He wants to be involved, and he is going to back up his promises with his presence. We see the same thing happen, what, several thousand years later, 
When Jesus, what does he do? God gives us the ultimate promise of forgiveness, the ultimate promise of eternal life. And, and I guess God could have come up with some kind of other way to make all that work. But, but no, the only way, the best way, was when Jesus came in his presence into the world. And God backed up his promises with the presence of Jesus. But here, we meet Sarah right? We met her filled with skepticism because she has forgotten the ability of the promise maker. We do the same thing. We forget that the impossible is possible with God, that there is nothing impossible for him. She laughs with the idea here that that God is telling a joke. Did you, if you look deeper into what the word means when she laughs, it's more like laughing like it's a joke. She was questioning God's truthfulness and ability. He's trying to pull one on me, she thought. And I want to ask you today, is that, is that where you're at right now? Are you questioning God's honesty and his ability? Again, like I asked you a few minutes ago, when you look at God, do you tell God that he is crazy? Or do you say, wow, God, what you are doing, wow, that's just crazy. It's amazing that you're able to do that. Which one will it be? Which one will it be? Will it be about you and your, and your questioning God's ability and his truthfulness? Or will it be about standing back and seeing what God can do? wow, this is, this is so important. And see, this is the tension, the tension that lives in all of us. Well, we say that God is crazy or that what he is doing is crazy because let me tell you, as we see throughout the Bible and we've seen it in our own lives, we know that sometimes God does do crazy things. But the impossible, impossible is impossible with God. God is able to do things. We can't question his ability. Now, we may wonder how he does it, but we know he can do it. And so today, I want to ask you this. I want to ask you this. How do you accept that God does the impossible without God's, or without questioning God's ability to do it? How will you do that? And I want to give you just two quick things today, two ways that we can do that. And the first one is this one. Get comfortable with impossible things. Now, here's what I mean, is that when obstacles come in front of you, don't just assume that they they can't be overcome. Now, this might seem weird, and this seems to go against every fiber of who we are, but did you know that sometimes we should just be comfortable? We should just get comfortable. We should just understand when we get into impossible places. We have to get comfortable with it. See, that's really what's happening here with Sarah. God's saying, you know what? I know that you don't understand what's going on, but get comfortable with where you are. I will get you to where you need to be. And that impossible thing in your life, it could be taken away at any moment. But in the meantime, just be comfortable there. And how can I be comfortable there? I can be comfortable there because I'm in God's presence. That's what, that's what he wanted for Sarah. He wanted her to know that she could be comfortable where she was. Even though she was old and it didn't seem like she could have a child, just be comfortable there, Sarah, because I'm God and I'm able to do the impossible, and what seems impossible, and my very presence proves that. And for each of us, too, we are living with something in our lives that just doesn't seem possible. Maybe it's a hurt in your family that just won't go away. Maybe that hurt just continues to get bigger and bigger. Maybe it's a financial struggle that just seems impossible, insurmountable to overcome. Maybe it's your health. Maybe you're fighting cancer or heart disease, maybe even COVID, and it just seems just so big. I think the important thing for us to to consider is that as you walk through that, As you're going through that, not to assume that God won't take it away because we know that he can. But what we don't understand is that sometimes he wants us to be in that place so that it can grow our faith. And we have to grow in that faith and and believe 
that he can take it away at any moment. So that's what I mean by getting comfortable with impossible things. And sometimes impossible things, at least in this world, will stay impossible. We don't have to like it, but we can find comfort in that place. Because God is able. We know that God is able. If he thinks that that is the right thing for us, if that is the best thing for us, he will take it away and he will do that in his time. And, and maybe he won't, but the fact is, is that no matter what, even if the impossible doesn't go away, we can also do this, is that we can also find peace in his presence. You know, God knew that Sarah was struggling. She, he knew that Sarah thought he was crazy. And that's why God came down. That's why Jesus came down and met with her himself. That, that should tell us something about who God is and his nature and his personality, shouldn't it? God's not afraid of pain. He's not, he's not going to hide from it. We saw this thousands of years later when Jesus went to the cross for us. You know what, in many ways, this story, I could see so many parallels between what God would do for us through Jesus and what he was doing here for Abraham and Sarah in this moment. We know that Jesus would come and he would join us in our hurt and in our pain. And what would he do? He would live with us. We, we, we know from reading in the Gospels that he would cry, that he lived in tough circumstances, that he he looked at pain and death in the face. He saw people going through the worst moments of their lives. But he knew, and we have to know this too, he knew that what was more important than overcoming the impossible is the presence that he offers. And he would offer his presence as a sacrifice. You know, what we can find is that the impossibilities that we deal with every day, the cancer, the family problems, anything, right? Is that God has already given us something seemingly impossible that trumps anything that we are dealing with. <laughs> He's restored us. You know what? The day-to-day, -day, the stuff that we deal with day in and day out, what we're going through, we don't, it, it doesn't have the final say. Because the cross has the final say. And it is in the presence of Jesus through the cross that we find peace in his presence and we can find comfort in the impossible because we know that God is able. We have a God who is bigger than it all. And so here's, here's what we all need to do. Here's what we need to do with this. We need to shift, you need to shift your default from this idea that God is crazy to this. We need to start saying, wouldn't that be crazy? That would be crazy if God did this, wouldn't it? <laughs> you see the, the shift in mindset? One of the biggest things, I believe this firmly, one of the biggest things that stands in the way of true faith in Christ is that we think that God is just crazy with some of the things that he promises. We like, the, we like it, but really? How about the idea of forgiveness? Really? I mean, Look at my life, God. I mean, how could I really be forgiven? The choices that I've made, the things that I've thought, because, I mean, he can see in our heads, right? I mean, really? You're forgiving me? Heaven? Well, it sounds great, God, but really, I mean, is that really, is that really true? I mean, it seems, it seems kind of crazy. Maybe, maybe you're a little crazy on that one, God. How about this one, eternal life? You know, one of the, I've mentioned this before, but one of the things that really saddens me and concerns me is I've run into too many Christians who say, I just don't really know if I'm going to heaven. And what that tells me is we're saying that God's crazy, right? Because how, how, is, how am I going to have eternal life with the life I've lived? How about the idea of a new earth? I mean, we see what's happening in our world today with COVID, and, and then we see election issues, and we see problems in our families, in our community, a new earth. It all seems like God's gone a little crazy, doesn't it? See, we have to shift our mindset. God's not crazy. We need to start thinking, won't it be crazy when God does something? 
We need to start thinking more like Abraham. We can't think that God is crazy because God can do any kind of crazy. (laughs) He can do all kinds of crazy and seemingly impossible things. He can heal. He can forgive. He can restore. We have to know that God is there and there is nothing that is impossible for God. And that God is always going to do the good and the right thing. And it's totally good and it's totally okay to think that God does crazy things. Because really, that's what God is in the business of doing. As we've seen through the book of Genesis, when we go back into the very first chapters, as God created the world from ex nihilo, right? From nothing into something. That's pretty crazy. And then as we read the entire story of the Bible into the Gospels, God does amazing things, but it all happened and it's all possible and it's all true. So we need to start saying something different. We need to start saying, wouldn't it be crazy if God healed me of my cancer? Wouldn't it be crazy if if my friend came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Wouldn't it be crazy exhilarating to hand my life over to Jesus To be radically transformed. See, that's what it means to shift your default. Shift your default from God is crazy to that would be crazy. That's what we have to do. Don't be afraid, again, that God can do crazy things. He can do amazing, seemingly impossible things. But don't say something is impossible because the impossible is not impossible for God. And if we accept this, here's what it can do. It can open the way to let God do what he does, which is what the impossible. You know, and I'm a firm believer that some of what we don't get in life has nothing to do with God. We might think, well, God didn't give me this or God hasn't done that. I'm a firm believer that in so many cases that we have not received from God because we haven't asked. Now, I'm not just saying that God will give us anything we want. But I know that we often don't ask because we believe that God has his limits. That some things that just seem impossible, they just can't happen. So my question for you is, what are you holding back from allowing God to do in you? What are you holding back on? James, Jesus' half-brother, said in James chapter 4, verse 2, he said this, You do not have because you do not ask God. Is that you? Have you not asked God? Maybe that situation in your family, maybe you've not even asked God because it just seems so big. Maybe that health issue, you've never asked God because it seems too big and impossible. How many times have we not received because we never even asked? So we ask God because we know what God can do. Because we know that we know what God can do and God, what does he do? He goes ahead, (laughs) he goes ahead, and he does it anyway. I wanted to close today with with something that really, uh, I found this week that really jumped out at me that I thought was was pretty cool. I don't know if you've ever heard of of a guy named Igor Sikorsky. I think we have a picture of him. Here he is. Igor Sikorsky was, was a boy of 12 years old. His parents told him that that people had already proven that flight was impossible. That's what his parents had said, that flight was impossible. Of course, it was Sikorsky who would build the first helicopter, and he would also grow a a huge company that even exists to this day, building helicopters. But something he did in response to what he heard when he was younger that I think is, is very funny in a sense, but it's very important as well. In, in his American plants, where they were building the helicopters, here is the sign that he had posted. Here's what it said. It said, according to recognized aerotechnical tests, the bumblebee cannot fly because of the shape and the weight of his body in relation to the total wing area. The bumblebee doesn't know this. So what does he do? He goes ahead and he flies anyway. <laughs> I love that. See, the world, and, and maybe even you, maybe you've even told yourself this, You've told God, the world's told God that he can't do something. And maybe you've asked him to do something, and it just isn't happening. And and you're like, well, it's just not possible. It's just not something he can do. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. This final thing today is that God is who he is, 
And he is going to do what he is going to do anyway. Even if it seems impossible, even when the world says it can't happen, God says it is possible with me. So that's my encouragement to you today, that no matter what you're walking through, just like Sarah and the encouragement she received, to continue to remember that with God all things are possible. The same thing is true in your life. That promise hasn't changed, and it's still there for you. Would you uh, please join me in a prayer? Father, we come before you today, and too often we have limited who you are. We limit your truthfulness. We question whether what you say is really going to happen. And, and then on top of that, we question whether even, you're even able. And God, we know that that comes from our fears. That comes from our lack of faith. Father, forgive us. And Father, we know that even when we have those, la- those moments where we have lack of faith, you don't give up on us. We know that you didn't give up on Abraham and Sarah as she later had a child that gave that it was that first generation of this great Israelite nation from whom your son would come through. God, you don't give up on us. But Father, today as we hear this message, we're all dealing with different things. We've, we've been confronted by so many things, especially this year. 2020 has been a tough one. And God, it just seems so impossible at times. Father, you have us here in this moment in time in history so that we can find peace in your presence and so that we can maybe even find comfort in this uncomfortable place so that we can grow and so that we become more reliant on you. Father, help us to understand that it's the circumstances in our life are, are merely just things that you use to grow us and to show your love towards us. And so, Father... Forgive us when we question your ability and your truthfulness. Give us the ability to find comfort in your presence and in this moment of life. And we know that it's all possible because of what Jesus has done. That Jesus came and gave us his presence so that we could find peace. Thank you so much for loving us like that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.